Welcome to the latest edition of Talking Data. Our Talking Data series seeks to offer timely insights into macro market themes along with macro data and its impact on the economy and markets. I'm Kristen Radish of Arbor Research and Trading and I will be your host. Our presenters are Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. 2020 was arguably the most unusual year in market history, highlighted by the shortest bear market and the fastest recovery in market history. What surprised the most and what went according to expectations? Jim, I'll let you get us started today. Yeah, thanks. At first, I want to do emphasize that, that what you saw in 2020, you're going to be very difficult to find some kind of analogous year, 35% bear market that completely recovered to new highs within three months in stocks. <clears throat> Nothing even close in history happened to that. But as I look through our total return review to talk about some of the returns, I guess I'll start with what wasn't a surprise, because I could talk all day about surprises. And what wasn't a surprise was probably world equities uh, at this point. And I'm going to look at local return equities. This was the pandemic year. This was the year that um, the economies around the world, especially the developed economies, really took their worst decline or contraction since the Great Depression. So you ended the year with the UK stock market down 2%, with the Swiss stock market down 13%, with the overall Euro stock market down 2% again, highlighted by uh, France down 5%. And even in emerging markets, you saw Brazil and Russia uh, down uh, up just up 5% for Brazil and up 2% for Russia. Very paltry returns given all of the risk. In commodities, it really was a story of what do you think about energy? And I'll give you an example. The Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, the S&P Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, heavily weights oil. It was down 23%, 24% to be exact. The Bloomberg Commodity Index heavily weights industrial metals. It's down 3%. So one index was down 24, another was down 20, was down three, highlighted by the, some wild numbers here, and that is that energy was down 43% for the year, and silver was up 43% for the year. I don't know if I've ever seen such a widespread between two commodities in, in the same year. Those numbers are consistent with, well, we had a pandemic and we had a big decline in the um, uh, in the stock market, uh, we had a big decline in the economy. So you would expect some negative numbers in commodities as well too, depending on how you, you weighted oil. Those are what I would say were the consistent numbers. The inconsistent or the surprises now on the other side, all in the U.S. The U.S. stock market was far and away the best performing stock market um, in the world. Uh, in the world. It was up, uh, according to the MSCI indexes, the U.S. was up 21%. When I pointed out, most of the indexes were down in the year, and the U.S. was up 21%, according to the MSCI. According to the um, S&P, it was up 18%. Another big surprise was the 30-year Treasury still outperformed the uh, S&P. It was up 19%, where the S&P was up 18 The The um, 10-year Treasury was up 11% as well. Last surprise was the, the dispersion within the major sectors, I think is unprecedented as well too. You had information technology tech up 44% and you had energy down 34%, a 70 plus percent spread between the best and worst index uh, sectors in the S&P, unheard of. To have any, nothing even close to that has happened. You can see that too with growth being up 30% for the year, value being down 9%. So the European stock markets and the commodity markets seem to go as you would have expected. Down years, struggling. Well, that's what happened with the economy. US markets, on the other hand, roof shot, went straight up. But within those numbers, as you break them down between growth value, the sectors, there was some tremendous differences in those numbers that typically you would never even imagine to see one sector down 40%, another sector, or one sector down 35% energy, and another sector up more than 40% tech. 
at the same time. So that is unheard of as well, too. Uh, those are kind of a recap of 2020. At the end, we'll talk about 2021. Benjamin, you got any thoughts or comments about what I just went through? No, I think that's that's all pretty much, uh, you know, I would agree. A lot, a lot of it is a surprise. There's not much that is kind of following what would be the typical path. The only thing I can point to maybe is U.S. 10-year note yields. Um, you know, kind of did track what historically recessions do, which is you see 150 basis point drop in 10-year yields, which we pretty much did, and then you grind sideways until the Federal Reserve decides you know, that the recession's over, maybe things are going well, we're going to start looking at hiking and so on, and that's kind of where um, things are at now in terms of the time point, not that the Fed is, is doing that at all, um, but now the question is, you know, what do yields do? Do they grind sideways, go higher? Um, you know, I agree that huge dispersion is, is probably the story. Um, and I think, you know, now is a good time too to compare asset classes. We can do a little bit of a dive into risk adjusted returns. And uh, what those show, if you look at sharp ratios across all these major asset classes, this really was the year of fixed income. So as Jim said, the 30 year bond outperformed the S&P 500, which is pretty impressive. Um, and within the, the treasury universe, tips were surprisingly the kind of the shining star uh, with the highest sharp ratio 1.28, looking at daily returns across all major asset classes. That's followed by gold, MBS, 10-year notes, investment grade corporates. Does this, this ring any bells? And it, it should, I'm sure Jim, uh, it's ringing for Jim. Uh, these are basically the, the Fed supported kind of trades. So if you were to not fight the Fed, let's just go with them and, and load up um, those were the best places to do so on a risk adjusted basis. And hey, I think ben? that's something they're going to have to see uh, going forward. Hey, Ben, could you yeah. could you define risk adjusted basis for those that are not familiar with it? Yeah, so we're just looking at sharp ratios, which are essentially average daily returns over the standard deviation of those returns. And we also take out a risk free rate, which is the, uh, we're looking at the three month treasury bill. So it's that excess return divided by the standard deviation of the daily returns of, for example, the S&P 500 or the 10 year tip. And that gives us then the ratio of how much return we're getting relative to the risk taken. So anything above one means you're getting more risk, a more return for the risk that you're taking and the assets that did that throughout the entire year, including the demolishing that we saw in March and April are essentially these Fed supported kind of don't fight the Fed uh, assets, which I thought was, you know, made sense, uh, but I think it was a big surprise to investors. One of the things I'm looking at your table as well too, and one of the things that um, jumps out at me at the table is, if you pick out the best and the worst returns on a risk adjusted basis for any given year, it tells you almost nothing about what happens in the next year as well too. Would you agree with that? Yes, so that's that's like we were joking, I think before we came on to this call that if, if it was that easy, that you, you what was strong, and I think you brought the word autocorrelation though, which is true that if you do have strong returns, does that mean strong returns going forward or weak returns? You know, if you have weak returns, weak returns going forward. Um, and, and that's just not the case. There's no consistency. If it was that easy, you wouldn't need any of us. You wouldn't need any managers. You wouldn't need CNBC and so on. Um, you just need to know stocks only go up, which I know is kind of the phrase um, of 2020. So um, does this mean anything looking forward? Not, you know, not really. I mean, that kind of gets to the question of, you know, what are the expectations now going forward? What are the big risks? And maybe we can dive that into, into that a little bit, Kristen? Yeah, sure. Third part. Yes, I mean, that's what we want to end today is we've recapped, um, you know, the surprise, the highlights of 2020, but what going forward, looking forward, what can we expect? Ben, you take that one. Sure. So the, the big surprise to me, uh, apart from the returns, is also investors flows. So we saw, as Jim's talked a lot about, is we've seen a lot of diving into individual names. Uh, but if we look at more of the ETF universe and maybe of mutual funds too, investors really didn't get truly risk on and join in on this rally, uh, looking at you know, broader investment vehicles like ETFs until about September or so. Um, and now they've come roaring back from about you know, maybe 10, 20% of all ETF inflows on a three-month rolling basis. We're going into equities uh, through early September. 
that jumped to now, now over 70%. And some of these Fed trades that we were just discussing that were such high performers on a risk adjusted basis have actually started to come off now. And we've seen things like investment grade corporates, high, high yield corporates, gold, all of the flows that they had enjoyed um, uh, you know, over the, the pr prior number of months have started to slow and even turn to some, some you know, a little bit of selling going forward. So the question is, we have these 13 three programs ending that were, you know, that was now kind of being baked into the cake. That the Federal Reserve had all these facilities. And we also now have the question mark of inflation, something that we've talked a lot about and what the Fed's going to do about it. And we had Evans talking just earlier this week, um, I believe yesterday, indicating that they want two and a half percent headline inflation or even maybe even core inflation. And that means things will run hotter. We've seen some big distortions in markets like we talked about last time with tips break evens. That curve, inflation expectations, has now gone flat to slightly inverted. And is that something the Fed is going to allow to happen, allow these short run inflation uh, expectations and actual inflation to run hotter or not? Um, so should we expect these Fed supported, you know, kind of markets and trades to continue in a dur into 2021? I think the jury's out. Um, and I think that I'm more suspect of that and not as big a believer um, in the expectation that they'll follow this AIT or average inflation targeting, you know, new regime. I don't know how you feel about that, Jim. Yeah, I mean, on the on the last point, I think the Fed can uh, say that they'll they'll tolerate whatever inflation level they want. They can tolerate a million percent or two and a half or whatever, as long as the market's okay with it. The question is is you know i keep coming back to fourth quarter of 2018. oh we're gonna we're gonna taper the balance sheet by 60 billion a month it's going to be an automatic pilot that's going to be watching paint dry and the market i'll use a technical term here the market shit its pants over that and within two weeks the fed completely eliminated that program because the market didn't like it so it isn't that evans or the fed wants two and a half percent it's is is the market okay when we get there is it okay with two and a half percent? We'll see. I I have my skepticism about it, but I could very well be wrong. But we'll see what happens when we get there and where the market is. So that's kind of where I would be with it. On 21, I want to highlight something, Ben, you said in the beginning. Um, there was a tremendous, and maybe this is why the European markets struggled and the commodity markets struggled but the U.S. market was a roof shot. What changed during the year is that the U.S. market became a retail individual stock and option market. People opened accounts to buy Zoom and Tesla and Etsy and all of the favorite names in Google and Apple and all the FANG names and everything. They bought those names straight up. No longer were they giving their money to professional managers or even passive ETFs. Although, there was some playing in those as well, too, but they were chasing individual names. And that's why I thought you've got that tremendous dispersion that you had in the market, because, you know, it was, you know, I joked many times that, you know, um, one of the sectors I've been very focused on is like the new financial uh, firms, the market access trade web, MSCI, the index in uh, S&P Global. These stocks are up 80 or 90 percent in the last year because the whole structure of the market is going online. Costs are coming down. The big expensive brokerage houses and banks are being assaulted by this new thing. But boy, if you tweet about that, you get like three responses to it. Uh, and because no one understands what market access does except for fixed income guys that trade corporate bonds. But if you tweet uh, three words, I like Zoom you'll get 5,000 responses to that, both positive and negative as well. So my point is that retail is what's going to at least begin the year in 21, that they're all going to be chasing those favorite retail names. Now, does that end the year that way? Uh, that becomes the big question. Do we get inflation? Does, does something come along with the economy struggling that changes those flows? Do we have a disappointment in stimulus? Uh, no, there's an expectation that we're going to get a lot more stimulus under a Biden administration. All those questions will have to be answered. But I come back to your, you know, risk adjusted returns. The Fed supported numbers did the best this year. 
most likely they won't be in 21. Now, that doesn't mean starting January 5th, they'll start being bad. You know, it could be the fourth quarter that, that, that it could change. It could start changing tomorrow um, at that point. But uh, I do think that for 21, the Fed support is definitely going to come into question. So here, really quick, two two things. Um, one being that um, the I think you're spot on the retail side, which a lot of us kind of were battling you, Jim, throughout the year. On this doesn't make sense. They're not. They can't be leading the market with lows. They're not important. You know, I think some of us are eating our words a little bit now on that. And what I've been doing over the past couple of weeks, and we can talk about this in future podcasts, is using search activity uh, for options. Everything from, am I putting on, you know, trying to learn or put on an iron condor or butterfly options of some sort, you know, call, put options, delta spreads, and, you know, am I getting long or short the market? All of this search activity is out there. And it's what's impressive is that the connection to returns and future returns over the next number of weeks has become intensified over the past two years and specifically this most recent year. And to me, that's kind of more proof that there is a retail component here. Maybe it's not ultimately deciding the long-term trend, but they are impacting things on a week-to-week -week or maybe a month-to-month -month basis. Something we can dig into while we complete the research. The second thing really fast is that I think the, you know, especially the dollar and even the US versus foreign markets, a lot of what happened was we saw this cratering in the spread between shadow rates for the US in the Federal Reserve and then everybody else, the, you know, the ECB, even, uh, you know, RBA, um, uh, BOE and so on. And with the collapsing in the shadow rates, meaning that the Federal Reserve Fed fund shadow rate collapsing to zero and now going negative uh, allowed, you know, it's kind of indicative of stimulus, indicative of a weaker dollar. And I think the big question mark is now that we've kind of uh, seen this heavy swift convergence and it's, I don't know if it's going to continue, do we get that say, same oomph behind these Fed supported trades? And so that's why I'm on the fence. I don't think there's that much more room to go unless we all of a sudden do some kind of negative interest rate policy or something you know, wilder. I'll just conclude by reminding everybody it's Dave Portnoy's world and we're just uh, living in it as well. So <laughs> that's, that, that's the story of 2020. And, and Portnoy, um, just you know how the retail investors think, it was August that Portnoy was babbling incoherently because you know he's a big owner of Penn stock. Uh, he couldn't believe that Penn was above 40 and how rich he was. And last week he was complaining that it was under 100 again. So you know all of a sudden at 40 it was it was look at how expensive it is at 40, and then four months later when it hits 100, look at how cheap it is. Highlighting the old saw that the higher they go, the cheaper they get when it comes to retail <laughs> mentality. Well, yep. thank you, Jim. Thank you, Ben, for your thoughts today. Thank you to our audience for joining us. Um, as a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is an institutional research and brokerage firm. Our two most prominent offerings are Bianco Research and Arbor Data Science. For any questions, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Have a great day.